Okay. Let's see. Uh, it looks like we're live. So here's a thought for the day. Actually, let me shift something here, and then I'll give you the thought for the day. <laughs> uh, one of my teachers used to always say, every, not every time we made a mistake, but often enough, right? Uh, he would say, uh, don't be an accomplice to your own ass kicking. So the big question is this, how are self-defense and success-minded people like us, concerned citizens worried about protecting ourselves, our loved ones, and the things we care about from the monsters we know exist in the world? How do we train in a way that gives us the skills, knowledge, and understanding we need without becoming paranoid fighters or killers ourselves, and yet still allows us to be the hero protector the world needs us to be? That's the question, and this podcast will give you the answers. My name is Jeffrey Miller, and welcome to Kudan Radio. Real training for real people in a real world. And I'm back. All right. So uh, today I remember to turn chat on. So uh, if you're on any of the social networks, you should be able to <clears throat> post some comments and, and that'll work. Uh, I got my handy dandy Space Age uh, headset on here so that I can circumvent whatever mic problems I'm having with my laptop. And, um, well, I might as well preempt this. Uh, just in case the alarm gets sounded, right? Um, I've got my trusty bodyguard here, <laughs> Sparky. He's a six-year-old rescue that my wife uh, needed. You know, it works needed, right? Uh, after the death of uh, like her favorite cat. So I'm not sure how that worked. But anyway, so I got that. Today, I remember to uh, get a drink for myself so that when I get parched, I'm all set. And uh, my daughter bought me this uh, as a gift, right? So uh, I don't know. Maybe she likes me. I'm not sure. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm not trying to live up to that. So anyway, uh, let's see. So we are live. Everything is good, and we are going. And uh, so this is episode 73, episode 73 of the Kuden podcast. So <clears throat> maybe another drink. All right. So, um, yeah, so as we continue on uh, our little journey here, um, talking about little things that uh, really <clears throat> should be a primary focus if we are self-defense oriented people. If not, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with being, you know, liking Asian culture. I do. Right. Uh, or, you know, being really um uh, jazzed by like the history and those kind of things. I am right. Um, but we can't deny that a lot of people get involved in martial arts, um, uh, a way to, it's just another way of many ways in life to validate, uh, their existence, right? For some people, it's university degrees, uh, not that they don't have a purpose in certain realms to get jobs and, and those kind of things. Right. But their head gets all wrapped around it. Uh, and it, that little demon rears its ugly head when there's a conflict or a little, um, moment where they're going to describe their relationship with others or their relationship with the world. And that becomes the identifier. Okay. Um, a quick story on this, right. Um, one of my previous intimate friends, um, way back in the day, <clears throat> uh, she had this thing, right. Where, uh, this is what they were taught all through life, right? Growing up that, you know, you go through school, you graduate, you go to college, get a degree, become something. Um, but then you marry somebody who can pay all the bills and you don't have to work anyway. Right. So, so um, th this is, this is in the realm of materialism, right? Uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's a, uh, there's a, a kind of, it's not really a parable, but I guess it could be, right? There's a story of the three lords of ego, right? So one has to do with physicality, one has to do with intellect, and one has to do with spirituality. But <clears throat> what it really still points back to is spiritual materialism, right? Um, <clears throat> we need things outside of ourselves to justify ourselves, right? So here's just another way, but in life where we can be an accomplice to our own butt kickings, right? So I'll keep shifting here dog left, but, uh, no sign that he won't be back anyway. So, um, uh, so we're, 
and this is just one of many occasions where this popped out, but, um, you know, we, we had, uh, gone to the store for something, right. She had worked at this, uh, pharmacy that was located inside of a, a department store. And, uh, <clears throat> um, so we, we, you know, it was a day off, and so we went. We were going to the store, and uh, we had gotten out of the store, or gotten out of the car, and we were walking in. So we we're walking across the parking lot toward the main entrance, and there's someone who works there, right? They, they have the uniform and the little name tag and stuff, and and their face says they're not having a good moment, right? And I, I try to really not take a snapshot and make it the whole thing, the whole picture, right? Which is a common mistake that a lot of people do. I've got to try to recenter my camera here. Okay, so, uh, cause I'm looking at me and it's bugging me. Anyway, so um, so we're walking along and I said, wow, it looked like they're happy. And the first words out of her mouth were, well, that's what they get for not having an education. And I just stopped, I mean like physically stopped and just kind of looked at her and, and you know, she was confused, right? Not for the same reasons that I was confused. And I said, what does someone's education have to do with having a bad moment or being angry? You get angry. You have a college degree. So I'm confused, right? Uh, this is another one of those moments where she talked to me for a little while afterwards. But um, I have this... this uh, <laughs> <laughs> diagnosed Tourette's where instead of uh, vulgar language coming out, it's uh, truth kind of things. So I learned that from one of my teachers, right? My job is to wake people up, not necessarily be their friends. All of my friends that are really, really close have shared experiences, normally dealing with violent people in the world. Uh, and we're all very spiritual people, not necessarily religious, spiritual people. Um, and we have a penchant for the truth, right? So anyway, uh, but my thing was they could have just dealt with a crappy customer seconds before we turned and engaged with them. And so here's this remnant, right? They could have had an argument with somebody 10 minutes ago, an hour ago, whatever. You know, I know that some people, they, they have moments with a certain human being or a certain situation or whatever, and then drag that through their day wrecking everything else along the way, right? So, you know, they, they were upset at somebody at 7.30 in the morning, and next thing you know, uh, it's 7 o'clock at night. They're in a completely different environment, uh, nowhere near the person that irritated them, and so, but they're still treating everybody around them the same way that they would be treating that other person. I'm, I'm sure you can relate, right? Not that you do it, because we're all perfect, right? Um <laughs> like to say that so people aren't like shooting flaming arrows through cyberspace and it comes out of my camera and shoots me in the eye. Anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it's not like this person walks around this way. Right. So, um, this kind of reminds me of, uh, one of my first lessons in this art. Uh, my teacher at the time made a reference to, to the way martial artists and self-defense people tend to engage with the physical aspects of their training as though it's like 90 to hundred percent, right? When the reality is that strategic thinking, assessment, tactical application, there's a whole bunch of what I call soft or invisible skills that make the, not only make the physical techniques work, but they also help to decide which technique or skill, when, and applied how and how much and where and, and those kind of things, right? So it's certainly not the first level of training, but, but you know, it's, it's an important thing, right? So uh, it, it, what he was discussing was people's attachment to uh, stances, right? So in Japanese, uh, the word ati, right? Uh, in our art, in our system and other systems like Aikido and Aiki Jiu Jitsu and things like that, right? They use uh, this concept of Kamai, right? Unfortunately, if the teacher doesn't understand and passes on that ignorance, or they do understand, but the student misinterprets, right? They can be seen as being the exact same thing. 
okay? And so they look like these poses that you take up and that's what you're going to fight from. And it's not that it, that's not true, but people can become, I'm going to borrow a word here, right? People can become married to something where they won't let go, right? Um, and I don't mean you need to let go of marriage. So, so be, girls don't be doing that, right? So anyway, and, and guys are laughing right now, but anyway, um, so uh, they, get, they get stuck, right? So a little quick uh, kind of thing here with the difference between the two, right? Because it's not just two different words, right? In, in English, we tend, we like to throw around uh, lazy ego language, like, yeah, it's close enough for government work or same difference or uh, no, okay? So dachi, right? Dachi, a stance is actually named for the position of the legs, Okay. A lot of you probably already know that, right? The position of the legs. So that's where horse stance, cat stance, those kind of things, right? Uh, Nikodachi, whatever. These things come from, okay? But a kamai, right, conventionally speaking, because, again, we always have to look at omote, outward, obvious, and uda, hidden, backside, the, the stuff nobody can see kind of thing, right? Uh, kamai are conventionally named for the position of the upper limbs, jumonji. Ichimonji, because right? you're making a figure one, you're making a figure 10, that kind of thing, right? Uh, Hachimonji, uh, figure eight, I'm not going to stand up. Uh, Haso, right? Haso uh, is actually a contraction of Hachiso, right? Eight actions, or that always points to infinite, right? It's like taking a number eight and laying it on its side, so now it's this infinity loop, right? But that gets its name because when we're in the sword posture, I'm going to turn this way, we're in this sword posture, right, and we're holding it, holding the handle and this kind of thing, right? There's a Japanese Chinese figure eight created by this angular kind of thing, right? But it, it, it points to way more, like in our system and, and some other systems too. I'm not just kind of differentiating. Um, I'm just not going to throw out a whole bunch of names. Um, it goes beyond that, okay? So it's a start, right? But in our art, it's not just the position of the upper body and the, and the arms. It's also the position of the head and the heart, right? Where is the, where's the thinking? Where's the, what's the mindset uh, or the state of mind? And what's the emotional drive, the, the, the intention, those kind of things going on, right? So that kind of shifts things, right? So while kamai can be used and can look like stances, right? They're not chosen the same way, right? Stances are typically chosen strategically and, and things like that based on uh, what the person wants to do, right? Because come on, stances can both, both be uh, can both be seen as uh, like canon, okay? So you point it where you want things to go, and then you fire off that round, right? So it's the base from which you uh, launch your attacks and, and things like that, right? Um Come I, again, have that outward kind of thing as well, right? At least in the beginning levels of training, right? But they're actually, they actually come from the inside out, okay? So the come I, right, at least the way I've been taught and in this system, are the, the physical body is a reflection of what's going on at the, at the core, in the head and the heart, okay? So... Another way to translate kamai, right? Because kamai can be translated as uh, posture, position, attitude, those kind of things, right? So, uh, but another way to translate the word kamai, and I actually got this from uh, a native Japanese uh, person. I was I was visiting friends in Canada in Toronto one time uh, for a seminar, and we had this after training dinner at this nice restaurant and everything, and. Uh, I don't, I can't remember if she trained or not. I know she wasn't there for the seminar. I think that my friends who were really tied in with the Japanese Canadian community, uh, were just friends with her. Right. And she worked at the J Japanese consulate in Toronto. Right. So, uh, we're sitting at this table, we're enjoying dinner and everything. And, you know, my friends are sitting off to my, uh, left, which right, maybe you're right when you're looking at this anyway. So, um, She's sitting across from me, right? And uh, I'm not—I'm uh, not one to uh, waste opportunities. 
Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm always a big fan of if I want to know how a native of a certain place translates something or sees something. And while that's subjective, right, that's also colloquial, right? It's, it's a base understanding from their mindset. Okay? It's very, very difficult. It's, it's difficult enough to learn this stuff, but to try to learn it by using Western uh, reference points and mindsets and things like that, to translate a different culture, let alone a different culture centuries ago, uh, it, it becomes it becomes problematic, right? Which is why it's important to have a teacher who, who can pull that stuff out and take a look at it and those kind of things, right? Or at least point you in a direction. Whether you go and look it up or not is, is a completely moot point. Oh, hey, my friend Will, <laughs> Will Mayer's on. Hey, Will, long time no speak, man. Um, Will and I go way back, right? Uh, he used to kick my butt a lot. Anyway, so um, uh, both of us, many marriages and many lifetimes ago, right? So, uh, well, I don't know about you, many marriages. I tend to be a collector. Anyway, so, um, so where was I with that, right? So um, uh, the, the the we're having this dinner, right? And I'm, I'm you know, sitting across. And we're all kind of chatting. And then it was kind of a lull where the conversation shifted you know, a way where she wasn't directly involved. And I said, can I ask you a question, right? This is something that comes up in our art. And, you know, I, I would like to ask you, not that I believe that my teachers were mistranslating things or anything like that, but she wasn't in, she wasn't involved, right? So is this a normal everyday term, right? Um, or is it something that's very unique to Marshall? things, right? Uh, like we have, there's several lineages that have this kata called ikichigai, right? Ikichigai, I-K-I-C-H-I-G-A-E, ikichigai, right? Um, so for those of you who like to grab names and go, oh, it's shiny and glittery and it's special, right? Ikichigai is a common everyday Japanese phrase that means to pass by. Like for, if you and I are walking down the street in opposite directions and we pass by each other, that's ikichigai, Right. So all it is is describing the scenario, the setup where crap's about to happen. Right. So anyway, so what I said was, um, uh, what does Kamai mean to you? And she stopped and she thought she's, hmm. every and then she explained, you right. Japanese is more subjective. Right. Um, although if you, when you try to learn Japanese, it's way more specific and orderly. Uh, than and more structured than than English, but she said, hmm. "What kamai means to me is to be aware of your condition," which really pointed to in a direction that my teacher at the time was presenting things right, more of a mental emotional state, and then the kamai comes out of that, right? Um, and this is not unnatural, right? I mean, everything in this art is about naturalness, so. You know, if, if you're sitting around, uh, you're sitting someplace, you know, and, and uh, you know, you're thinking, man, there's nothing to do. Wish I had something to do, right? And you got this breathing going on, right? Or you might be even using the words, right? But your body has kind of this sunken, slumped, kind of thrown around kind of look to it, right? There's no life and whatnot. And, you know, somebody walks by and says, if you're bored, why don't you find something to do, right? Of course, what does ego do? <clears throat> I'm not bored, right? And then, you know, you fidget around and try to find things to show that they were wrong, right? Except that this is the way it works, right? The body tells on what's going on in the inside, okay? So what the hell does all this have to do with being or not being in a, an accomplice to your, you know, your own butt kicking, right? Well, <clears throat> I've been doing this for a little while. And the cool thing about martial arts training that I've learned is it's helped me translate and look at different personality types and, and things like that, right? And between this and, and, and my Mikio studies and, and things like that, right? Um, looking at how and why people do what they do, okay? And how I can get them stuck, is Mikyo is an esoteric form of this overt practice that's about 
overcoming our own proclivity for digging holes for ourselves, right? Um, uh, dissatisfaction and all that kind of stuff with life and moments and whatnot, uh, a lot of which we generate our, for ourselves, right? It's just easier to blame everybody else because, you know, ego has assumed itself God. But um, so it's a reflection, right? And uh, the, the between these two, uh, what look like very different practices, right? Um, it's helped me see how some martial artists or some martial arts instructors or security or not security, self-defense instructors and all that choose to teach for very different reasons, right? Some really, you know, don't like their life a whole lot, right? So they choose to teach, uh, not that they don't have something and want to share, right? But it makes them feel good to at least have some little box that they can be in control of and, and you know, everybody else has to do what they say, right? For other people, uh, it's a almost a feeling of, uh, of um, pain, right? Because they know what they've trained to overcome, right? So they see how other people are, you know, they're without this knowledge. So the, it's more of a compassionate kind of giving kind of thing, right? Uh, they tend to do it a lot for free, right? Uh, other people do it because, oh, it's a neat way to make money. And it's not that all these things can't kind of go you know, be happening at, at different times, but there's all these different things. And then what that did was cause me to look out into other realms in life, people that enter the ministry or the priesthood or uh, become leaders in a corporate setting or whatever, right? And to be able to look across and see how this was reflected, these same needs and desires and wants and all that were reflected, right? So, how does that show up when when we're you know in a self defense situation, right? Could, because on the overt side, and there's actually I've, I've been covering like three different things every time I do one of these things, right? So one has to do with what I'm calling the vehicle or the approach, right? You can call it style, system, art, whatever, right? Where people have their their head around that, and there's a certain belief about it and how it has to be done and whatever, right? But a lot of these get people stuck. And it, what I'm talking about today is it gets them beaten, broken, or killed, okay? Another one is an internal belief, right, about me, right, about the person, right? Uh, could be fears, could be doubts, could be, uh, could be egocentric arrogance, right? Uh, that leads the way and uh, causes them to uh, run into the bear's den and poke its nose and hope they can get back out before uh, it wakes up from hibernation and decides it's going to have lunch, right? And then another one is an external thing, and that's that's how uh, how we view others, right? So in this case, it is how we view uh, the opponent, the attacker, okay? And so are there others? Yeah, of course, but what I want to look at is, is how, how, what we believe about certain things and how we hang on to certain things can actually get us hurt. Right. And this is the part that ego doesn't want to get its head wrapped around is that it's our fault. Okay. It's these, it's these false beliefs or uh, false truths or, or misconceptions or, habits or whatever that that we're attached to and that leads the way okay again i'm going to go back to, to mikyo for those of you who've studied uh, even a little bit of buddhism or whatnot you know that it all goes back to something called the four noble truths and the fourth of those things is called the noble eightfold path okay so that that part is just about uh eight areas of your life that you should be mindful of and if you're mindful of them and control them you minimize, reduce, and or eliminate negativity, suffering, and all that kind of stuff. doesn't mean it doesn't exist because pain still pain, right? There's still sickness, old age, death, whatever, right? So uh, the, the idea here is in, in how these things kind of get in the way, right? So I want you to think about this, right? Uh, and again, you know, I kind of let off this episode with uh, 
with one of my teachers uh, reminding us in class, don't be an accomplice to your own ass kicking, right? Um, your job is to make him an accomplice to his. Okay. So that requires more than just cool moves, right? Because if I'm just doing caveman kind of things and I'm blocking his and hitting and all that, I'm not really controlling things as much as I'm doing the same thing he's doing and hoping that more of mine land than his, or I can take more than he can, that kind of thing. Right. So, uh, uh, so, um, what was I? Oh, with a uh, Shoshi Molster, right? Uh, don't be the couples to your ass kicking, right? Uh, those, that same thing is said, um, uh, but with different words, right? By one of, the Japanese master teachers uh, that I train with on a regular basis, Trace Sensei, right? And he will say, uh, good action do, good situation make, right? So he's using, he's very articulate with English vocabulary, but it comes out in Japanese syntax. So as, long, as soon as you can get your brain to switch on that, right? It doesn't sound funny anymore, but good action do, good situation make, right? The whole idea is, you do the right things more than likely, right? Unless it's influenced by a whole bunch of other things that you're not aware of, you're going to have better consequences, better outcomes, right? Bad, crappy, misinformed, ignorant, whatever uh, actions, right? You're going to get, right? So cause and consequence, cause and effect, uh, however you want to want to translate that, right? So, but it means the same thing, right? It implies things like assessment and observation and all that, right? So very quickly back to the to the Noble Eightfold Path, right? The very first of the Noble Eightfold Path, right, is right view or right perception. Interchange words, right? English doesn't do justice to a lot of these words, right? Or a lot of these concepts, but right view or right perception, right? This is not the same as right thought. Right thought is the second spoke, okay? Right perception, right view. So what we need to have is a clear understanding of the elements and things that are going on so that we can make the right decisions, use the right words, make the right plans, do the right actions that will produce the results that we're looking for, right? The reality is that perception is reality, right? The truth is that perception is reality, right? So it may only be reality for me, Right. Which is why the training is all about getting my perceptions of reality as close to being tuned into what's really going on as possible. Because otherwise I'm like a salmon swimming upstream. Right. And if I don't die along the way, what happens to the salmon after they accomplish their goal? They die. They never make it back. Right. So anyway, um, it's just a it's just a constant never ending battle kind of thing. So what we perceive about these things will dictate what we do. And this is, this is true about everything in life, right? Let me bring it back to the self-defense world. So what we believe to be true about or necessary about or critical or important or whatever about the training, the technique, the posture, the strike, the whatever it is, right? That is going to determine our thoughts, Plans, words, actions, effort, everything else, what we pay attention to, all of that, right, moving forward, okay? The same is true about what I believe about myself or what I know about myself and my skill set and what I'm able to do. And there's a whole bunch of things, right? Uh, I'm going to talk about one of them specifically today, but one of those things that will dictate what it is that I do or try to do or, or whatever, right? Uh, and then the third one is what I believe about him or the person coming at me or the people coming at me, right? The situation that I'm in, right? And what I know about how to deal with those kind of things, okay? So, um, uh, oh, okay, well, uh, so uh, anyway, so uh, so here's the thing, right? Uh, I've talked about this a, a, a couple of episodes ago or an episode ago or whatever, right? Um, there's been times where I've been in uh, in training, right? And I'll do something, right? I'll shift back into a position and I, 
the technique is working okay, right? It's it's doing well, right? And all of a sudden, my teacher will walk by, and, and you know, this is just one of those instances where he'll go, "You know what I would do if I were him right now?" Which is never a good question. <laughs> never a good. Mm, uh, no, and he'd go, I, you know, I'd punch you in the throat, or I'd kick you in the groin, or uh, I'd sweep your leg, or something like that, right? And you know. One of my default answers used to be because I was trying to, you know, make light of a corrective situation. Was usually uh, it's a good thing he's not you right now. But the reality is that he was pointing out something that my partner was letting go because he was just as attached to the technique or whatever move we were doing, and completely missing all these things that I had already learned. I already knew. Right. And here I was because I was doing this set model. I forgot to check what I was doing. Right. I forgot to check timing, distancing, angling, exposed targets or not. Those kind of things, because they're not going to change just because the technique changes or whatever. These are the constants. Right. So. What can happen is. We can be so wrapped around the validity of our system, right, Um, at whatever level we are, right, and not realize that what we've chosen uh, is not helping. It's not serving us. It's actually helping him. We are in this moment an accomplice to our own ass kicking because we're giving him something that he can use against us. Well, is my come I right? Yeah. It's just not the right one for the situation because he can take advantage of what you're doing, right? Or he knows that thing and has defenses and, and, and things to beat it, right? Um, is my footwork right? Uh, the way you're moving your feet are right, but in context with what you're trying to do and how you're trying to operate inside this bubble, not so much, right? So we can do all of the right things or we can do things the right and official way, but it doesn't match what's going on, right? So here's an example of uh, Friday, Friday's class, right? Uh, 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 for those of you who f- uh, follow along and are in the long distance training program, uh, we uh, do Zoom sessions with our, our live classes and things, right? So it's kind of an extra bonus for those folks that are in that program. And so I only had one person show up, right? So Erin uh, was there, right? And she's getting ready to test for her showdown. And so, uh, we did some light sparring, rondori, whatever term you want to put under that, right? But it was it was just kind of a free response kind of thing. Um, and she was doing okay, right? But it was very obvious where she was getting stuck because either she had a favorite, right? This I can do well, so I'm going to do this all the time. Or uh, she... Uh, believed that it was supposed to happen a certain way. And so she she came from a heavy duty, hard style karate background. So every once in a while this creeps in and I can certainly relate. Any of my friends that came from other martial arts before they got to this one knows how in the early stages that stuff creeps in, right? It's just like, it's so wired into muscle memory, it just pops out, right? Uh, so uh, she was kind of getting stuck, right? Where she needed to move, but got stuck because left brain, she didn't know what to do because she didn't practice certain moves enough that they got into muscle memory and she could just go right. Once, once I started to overwhelm her a little bit where left brain couldn't keep up, it was obvious that things were in muscle memory. It was just that left brain was overriding crap. Right. So she's keeping herself in what I call white belt mode, trying to think about what to do step by step, but the processor doesn't work fast enough for these things that are coming in, right? So, but then we switched out and I grabbed a training knife because part of her showdown test is some knife avoidance stuff, right? And so the first thing she does is go to one of her favorite come that she's really good with, but she doesn't switch out, right? So she's doing this number, right? Shift here for those of you, right? So she's doing this number, right? And so she has her torso positioned far enough away that it's difficult for me to reach out and get her. But this is between her 
targets, what most people conceive of as the targets and a target that I can open up and then she gets to be Spider-Man and starts praying around. Right. So I just kept reaching out and tagging that. Right. And it was frustrating her, but I had to stop her and say, don't, don't we teach you any other come on. You're all, oh, you're going to test for black belt for God's sake. Okay. Well, yeah, but I just, I don't do those as well. Why not? I don't practice them the same amount. I don't, I, I like this one better. Okay. Well, then that's the one that's going to get you killed. Perfect. Okay. So again, we can get so attached to this that uh, it's the thing that does us in, right? We're doing things the right way or the official way or the styles way or the lineages way or whatever. And we're getting our butt handed to us or whatever. Right. So again, we learned them, but and this was a really good analogy that one of my teachers gave me way back in the day. It's kind of like going through art school or going to mechanic school or anything like that, right? Where the first year student kind of has these delusions, right? They don't think they're delusions, right? Because they call themselves a mechanic or they call themselves an artist or whatever. Um, but what they're really doing is learning like for the artist, right? They're learning certain types of brushes, right? So the bristles, some are made from certain materials, some are made for others, whatever, right? And so then they learn how that brush picks up and lays oil-based paint, pastels, watercolors, those kind of things, right? Uh, they learn about mediums, right? Paper, canvas, brick, whatever, right? And then how paint goes on that, how pastels go on it, how chalk goes on it, how, these different things, right? So while they are doing things, they're creating little projects and they're making little drawings or paintings or whatever, right? They're not really an artist. It's not that they're not creating things that we might call art, right? But they're really exploring the science and they're learning how the tools and the medium work. Okay. There's this whole process, right? Same thing with somebody going to mechanic school. I remember when I was in uh, junior high school, I'm an old guy. So they used to call it junior high, not middle school. Because junior high sounds way cooler. Right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and I was in a shop class, right? So as a part of the shop class, right? Uh, we were fixing, uh, what were they? Um, Briggs and Stratton, lawnmower engines we were fixing them right we're barely 12 and out of diapers right and we're fixing engines right um so what we were really doing because you know we were they would have things brought in and whatnot right so we were we were learning about parts right so we might learn about the carburetor which i don't even think they exist on modern cars anymore but it's this thing that sucks in air and pulls in fuel right blends it together, drops it into the engine and it gets ignited and that's how you get power and all that, okay? That's the short version, right? So here's this thing, right? So we were, we were learning about fuel air mixtures and things like that, right? We're learning where that is on the engine and then what we have to do is, you know, we're taking one off, putting another one on, okay? What we're really learning how to do is like, do that, right? Replace a part. We're learning about the part, but we're also learning about the tools, okay? Because the teacher would say, always say things like, you never hit anything with a hammer or you never hit anything with a screwdriver and, you know, whatever. I don't know, screw something with a hammer. <laughs> but you get the idea, right? So it's the same thing we tell little kids, right? That's a, that's a marker, right? You use that for what it's worth. Stop chewing on it. Stop banging things with it, whatever. And then the kid grows up, you know, fixated on this can only be used one way, right? Not a bad thing, but it's, it, it does stunt things. And this, this kind of leads us into this kind of mindset. So, but we certainly weren't mechanics, right? We were learning how to use the tools and all that. So the whole idea is that you get to the end of this first part of your training. And what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to have a toolbox full of tools that you know, how they work, what they're used for, and how to use them, okay? And as far as medium goes, like with the artist or the mechanic, the thing he's working on, right? That's the, for the mechanic, right? This is the engine, right? Or his body's the engine, right? 
And for the artist, this is the canvas or his body's the canvas, right? But it's not really till you get to the point where, like, I've got a mechanic friend that if I pull my car in, you know, there's one, uh, I go I go in and stuff, and, and, and I always know where, where somebody typically is, right? I pull it in. They don't even think about anything, right? They just go, well, I really can't say until I hook it up to the computer and the computer tells me what's wrong with your car. Okay, fair enough, right? But I've got this one friend who has been doing this for a long time, right? We could be having a talk over dinner, right? And I'm describing this thing, and he goes, hmm, sounds like it's either this or this. But I'm pretty sure based on the description you're giving me, it's this. Or he'll ask a couple of locator questions. Does it happen when you do this, or does it happen? And so based on that, right, um, uh, I have a, one doctor that was helping me out with my knees and all that, and uh, he actually did the knee repair on uh, an ex-wife's knee. And... Um, I remember when she tore her ACL, we're in for this appointment and this uh, resident comes in, right? Or uh, maybe he was a, a fellow. He was learning to specialize in this kind of stuff, right? Uh, well, the doctor that I have at that time was like number six in the world for sports injuries that have to do with shoulders and knees and things like that, right? So this, this resident is like, ah, okay, so she's describing things and he's okay. Okay. So, uh, I really can't tell till I get an x-ray and if that doesn't show me, I have to get an MRI. So in comes Dr. Finelli, right? And he says, okay, so how is it presenting? Right? So the, the resident or whatever he was, right, starts describing this thing. And he, he looks at my ex-wife and he says, what's the pain like? And she said, you know, she described it. And he, he looks back at the resident. And he said, did you hear that? Did you hear those two words? It's the ACL and it can't be anything else. Because he understands how it all goes together. He's not just this guy who know, you know, went through an anatomy class and a physiology class and knows how to like reattach things. He knows how to diagnose based on where the pain is, right? So really important stuff. So anyway, um, Part of the training process is in learning how to assess what's in front of you, right? So you can choose kamai, strikes, things like that, right? I mean, can you imagine picking Ichimonji no kamai? Uh, so some of my friends that have lots of experience, like Will and a bunch of guys, that, that know, right? So can you imagine, right? Somebody's coming in with gorilla arms, right? So you're going to try to do one of these, blast his arm out of the way when his arm is as big as your freaking thigh, right? Um, well, that's what I'm good at. That's my favorite technique. Yeah. Hope your wife looks good in black, right? So, um, or, you know, you do this thing, right? And you come in with this knife hand, right? Except that he has no neck, right? He's like this golden glove, you know, boxer kind of guy. Or he's just, you know, he's 200 pounds overweight or whatever. And so he's got all this, all this armor. And the body, the part that you're supposed to be hitting to do the disconnect, it's not available. Right. So great. You did the cool move and we'll put that on your we'll put that on your tombstone. Right. So but the point here is we get so wrapped up in the officialness or this thing and doing it right that we really don't understand what right is. Yes, we have to learn the form so that we can start learning the lessons that come with it so that we eventually I see here's something that a lot of people miss. The past masters did not just pass down a list of techniques, do these moves, okay? That's the den show, right? The list of techniques. Complementary and more important than the den show is the makimono, right? The lineage scrolls where the philosophy and the strategy and all that kind of stuff is, is, is there, right? So what they passed down besides physical moves were the lessons that will allow you to get from where you are or where you started to where they were when they passed on the lessons as quickly and easily as possible. Okay. But we have to understand the process, not just how to ape the moves. Okay. Somebody posted something here. Uh, let's see. So instead of responding with a pull aside, you turn in and push an active to fly. I, I don't understand that statement or question. Um, it, it's not about, I can't answer a, so instead of do this other thing instead, because I'm not there. Okay? When somebody says, how would you defend against a punch? 
I irritate a lot of people because I say, I start asking questions like, what kind of punch is it? Is it a hook? Is it a big old flailing kind of thing? The person's just angry, but they have no skill, right? They're just cavemanning it, right? Coming around with this thing. Um, is it an uppercut? Is it a straight punch? Is it a jab? Uh, is it a boxer's right cross? Uh, what is it, right? Uh, where am I? What kind of clothing am I wearing? What kind of clothing is he wearing? right? Why is he attacking me? Is he just having a moment? And he's reaching out, right? Just because that's a habit thing for somebody who's angry, right? Or is this somebody who's looking to take me apart, right? I've been targeted, okay? What I'm going to do is based on a whole bunch of variables that the beginner typically isn't privy to unless that beginner came to the training because they were physically attacked and understand violence, to the degree that I did growing up and as a police officer and in the military and all that, or worse, because I've got friends that were in <laughs> way worse situations, right? Uh, so they understand what they need and they're looking at the training to be able to fulfill that. A lot of people come to training, they have no idea what they need. So they just become a blind disciple, just kind of following along because since they said, okay, so often it can end up being the blind leading the blind but I won't throw that rock today. Okay, so um, so that's one, right? And I really have to watch my time because I have to get to the dojo and do class here in a bit. Okay, so, uh, so that can get in my way, right? Another thing that can get in my way is my own sense of uh, belief about myself, right? This could range everywhere from, from self-doubt, right? So I'm learning this stuff and I'm doing really well. I feel confident in the dojo, right? Getting belts and all kinds of things. But what I don't tell anyone, not me, not you, again, we're all perfect, right? What I don't, what I don't admit to people is that if there's any hint of a conflict, argument, somebody yelling at me or whatever, mentally and emotionally, I just fold, clam up and try to escape. So in a controlled environment, I'm a master where I need it the most, where I need to produce the results the most, not so much, okay? And the last thing, last time you wanna realize that your understanding of your techniques and, and the, the vehicle, the, the system or whatever, right? Or the stuff that you've been hiding, right? The last place you want that to fail is when your, your well-being or life or the well-being or life of somebody you're trying to protect is on the line, okay? So a lot of us chuckle about this stuff, right? Um, but, you know, Will can probably vouch for this as well, right? We've all been to seminars or we've been to, to Japan or whatever, and we've seen people very high ranking and things like that, right? Um, but if, when you look in their eyes, what I don't see compassionate eyes. I don't see a humble, happy kind of person I see somebody who doesn't have a violent bone in their body and somebody who's probably going to cave or completely wig out when something bad actually happens, right? Uh, they have a hard time holding eye contact for even a second or two, let alone the four to six that might start to become borderline with the copulatory stare response uh, where you start affecting other people. But people who are very confident in their own skin. Uh, they don't feel challenged with that eye contact kind of thing. And they don't, um, they don't uh, like break, okay? So, but it could be that, right? Uh, it could also show up uh, as a, uh, as an arrogance, right? Okay, see, I know all this stuff. The thing I've chosen to train in is the best that could possibly be chosen, right? I got all my stuff together. And so, uh, yeah, I got this, okay? Um, and then what if you don't, okay? Uh, one of the, again, I keep going back to these lessons that I got that, that kind of helped me assess things better, right? You know, going into a situation, right? In, in, a, in many, most, most times, right? Unless you're being attacked by somebody you know, 
and you should know a lot about them and how they approach things. So it gives you a lot of information. And if you haven't, or you did want to think about those things, then, then you don't know anything. Right. But, uh, if you, uh, when you come into a situation, right, there's a, there's a couple of things you know about you, right? You know what you know, you know what you've learned, you know what you're good at, as long as you're not in denial or trying to just show off, right? And you know how you feel. And that's a huge part in picking Kamai and, and things like that, establishing distance and, and, and the strategies and tactics you're going to apply because that's the fuel to the, the, to the fuel of the car, right? So that, that goes a long way to dictating things. But you don't know very much about the attacker. You know he wants to hurt you, right? But you don't know things like what his specialties are, what his preferred techniques are, how far he's willing to go. Right? How much experience he has at beating or breaking or, or stopping other human bodies from functioning. Right? Uh, what his relationship is with going to or going back to jail. Some don't care. Some are not going back, so they're going to leave you in a hole. That kind of, You don't know those things, right? So we have to approach a situation, at least in the beginning, and that's that's one of the purposes for come on, right? Whether you take up a physical one or not, or you're just in this observational kind of mode and you're paying attention and you're assessing, right? You're being aware of your condition and you're collecting as much information about him as possible, right? Number one skill set of a ninja, information gathering, right? So uh, what I want to do is kind of figure out what these things are so I can come up with the right solution. Okay. If we could think of our martial and our self-defense skills or any of these skills, these life skills and all the stuff that we have, right. If we can think of the skills as elements for problem solving, we'd be a lot farther down the line instead of just uh, named dance moves. Like this is the cha cha, this is the rumba, this is the or the rumba, whatever, uh, or the you know whatever. This is the square dance. This is the Viennese, what whatever, right? There's a certain footwork pattern, and it's that that's how everybody identifies what that is, right? Um, but we're not see those people get to control their entire environment. They get to choose the music that fits their skill level and the tempo and the speed that fits, just like gymnasts, right? We have to follow his speed. He gets to dictate speed, intensity, and all the, all kinds of things, right? So it's very, very different. So uh, so we have to be careful about this arrogance. And, and, and I'm sure you've seen some of these things, right? Uh, one of them just makes me laugh is the guy that's going, right? <laughs> I always hope that guy gets punched in the throat. I always do, right? Because that's just stupid, Right. That's your you're betting your life and well-being that you can pull out in time. Right? It's like having unprotected sex, <laughs> hoping it all works out. Right. A lot of married people and people with kids that were wrong. Um, so <laughs> anyway, um, we have to be careful that we're not overestimating our own ability or underestimating our own level of ignorance. Okay, so this it, it relates to the vehicle stuff, but this this has to do with my perceptions of me. Okay, a lot of people get involved in martial arts and, and self defense training and all that because they were bullied or beaten or whatever, and so they got involved for the right reasons, right? I want to prevent that from ever happening again. I want to be safe and secure and confident and fearless and, and all those kind of things, right? Uh, but often, very often they end up becoming just like the person that sent them there. I don't mean their parents or whatever. I'm talking about the, the people that were beating and bullying and all that, right? And now they've got the skills, but they're still immature on the inside and they still you know, have low self-esteem and they're still weak and all that. So everything's a challenge, right? So they, they put themselves into situations that they probably shouldn't go into. Because those of us who know and can assess I know some really, really, really tough people. And without backup, we're not going into certain places. We're not confronting certain types of people, right? Uh, we're not pulling the ninja movie or the 
you know, the whatever where you're you know taking them all out because you know there's never any thought that they could find out who you are or who your family is and then protect yourself when you don't know where it's going to come from for the rest of your life. So there's just certain things that we will not do because it's stupid, right? Anyway, so that's the second one. The external is just the flip side of that, right? Is underestimating the attacker, okay? Remember, my martial arts better, my skills are better, look at all the experience, I'll kick his ass, whatever, right? So that's what'll get me in trouble, but the, other, the flip side of that is, uh, again, I don't know anything about this guy, but I'm gonna make certain assumptions Right. That because I'm better, he's uh, not skilled enough. Um, or here, here's one that gets a lot of people in trouble. Right. I'm fighting him. And only him. Next thing you know, his friends come off the bar stools or off the bleachers or whatever. And now you're surrounded in what you thought was a one on one kind of thing is now. uh not right so uh we need to learn to assess right uh and learning things like and i, I get it right there's a lot of stuff that was passed down in the scrolls there's tons between nine schools just that our grandmaster well that's me to say had soke ship of doesn't you know most people Missed the point that, you know, Ito Ryu, Musashi Ryu, and a whole bunch of these other lineages contributed because he had Menkyo Kaiden in these schools. So it contributed to this overall teaching thing, not just nine schools. But either way, just with the nine, oh, crap, you'll die before you master all nine schools, right? But um, we also have to remember that if we're only going to do things the historical way, there were a lot of things that exist today that were, did not exist, in 13th or 15th or 17th century Japan, okay? Infrared sensors, motion detectors, those kind of things. So I always tell my students, your stealth skills have to be way better than the stealth skills of the people that wrote the scrolls because they only had to worry about human and dog ears and dog nose, right? Human eyes are easily thrown but you know, i'll throw those in that's fine but anyway it's there's things that have to be you know, have to take into consideration right there's things today right okay tempo jutsu is a part of our art tempo jutsu is making a stone fly right it's the guns right but they were single shot cannons they were like flint locks or uh match locks or whatever right um thugs on the street could be carrying right so knowing the two primary places where somebody from certain environments, yes, I'm profiling, right, are probably carrying a weapon. And it's not where I'd be carrying it because I spend the extra money on a holster. They typically do not. Certain elements do not, okay? Uh, considering that my training at a range to prepare for a combat situation takes into account things like uh, – uh, counting rounds and reloading under pressure and uh, conserving ammunition because I have a finite amount and uh, uh, collateral damage, right? My rounds hitting other people or going in places that I, I don't want that to happen, right? Considering and understanding that the bad guy doesn't have any of those considerations. They don't care about any of that stuff, right? So they're more likely to do a spray and pray, Okay. And I know this because I've done my research and I've either talked to people in that realm or I've done I've done the reading and, and or watch documentaries or whatever where these people are interviewed and they spell out how they think. Right. So to be ignorant about the way an attacker thinks. OK. And there are different attacker types. There's different original intents. Right. So there's this logic that they have that you need to disrupt, right? Um, and if you understand those things and what the physical body cues are and, and things like that, it gives you information, but you don't you don't just look at one or two and go, I got him. Because in today's world, it's just too easy for somebody to come up behind you while you're dealing with his friend and knife you in the back or shoot you from across the street or run you over with a damn car, right? It has nothing to do with fair, right? 
Okay. So anyway, so, you know, again, when you're looking at self-protection, uh, you know, a lot of people have this problem with modernizing things. I don't know that I've modernized it. Like when people think of modernizing, they think of like scrapping the old model and then making up their own thing based on what they perceive to be so, because that's outdated and doesn't work. The technology still works. We just have to learn how to apply it so that we understand that, again, going back to vehicle, this, uh, okay, in the gosh, this, this counter-strike, right? Or this come I, right? Let me shift so that, for those of you who are brand new to this, right? So you're in this position, right? Understand that it was designed for a straight line ski, right? Something that's that comes at you very much like a spear or a halberd or a sword, which is what it was based on. That's why it's not called an ooch, a strike. Ski, right? It's delivered the same way a spear and a, and a sword is because it's based on that kind of thing, right? But to understand that that's the tech, that's the attack and context that it was designed in, right? So when somebody throws a big old heavy haymaker coming around and it hits here, not a whole lot in here that'll hold this from knocking you off balance, right? So if that's that fighter, it's not that I don't want to have this thing out here, but when he goes for it, I want to be able to slip so that he misses or... Uh, I want to just choose a different come all together, or I might choose this, but I need to understand the full lesson. Right? It's kind of like um, I tell my the, the the young students in my class. We talk about accidents, right? And I say, you know, how playing with your friends, and uh, you know, somebody's having too much fun, right? Next thing you know, you got hit. That ever happen? Oh, yeah, nine out of ten times unless they completely forgot <laughs> yes of course it happened right so you run into mom right you're crying you tried to kill me and what's mom say that was an accident right accidents happen right well what i very quickly tell them is okay you're a big boy now you're a big girl now right that's the baby lesson because your brain wasn't in a place to understand so parents had this expedient lesson problem with this is that a lot of adults are still walking around with the three-year-old lessons. So there's no, there's no other way to explain it than accidents happen because the cognitive reasoning's not there. I'm not going to tell you that at three because the cognitive reasoning's not there to understand how I'm explaining your understanding. So anyway, right? So accidents happen, right? It's okay. Accidents happen. Say you're sorry. Say you're sorry. That kind of thing, right? But at this age, you need to understand that accidents don't happen. Accidents are caused, Okay which now is a conflict because we've always thought of accidents as being just out of the blue. But if you understand karma and cause and effect, nothing happens out of the blue. So accidents are caused. They're caused by one of two people, somebody who's doing things in a haphazard or unmindful way, and they're not paying attention and they damage person, thing, whatever, right? Themselves. Okay. Or, we are around something dangerous. We're not paying attention and we walk right into it. Okay. So as soon as we can realign that, right. And this comes from our Miko training as well. As soon as we can realign that and understand the personal responsibility aspect behind it, a lot of things start to change. Okay. But just like that, that misunderstanding, right. Or that little missing piece or the, 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 grown-up lesson, right? It's getting the new lesson, the new version, because we're older and we can understand more. It's the same thing with, with our training, right? If we're always training off a straight line kind of thing, then these 45 degree angles always work and we never run into this problem, right? I remember the first time I ran into that problem. I was dealing with somebody who was a Taekwondo practitioner, really, really good when I was stationed with the army in South Korea. Right? And I just started with this stuff and Oh, he was sweeping my lead leg and he was going after my arm because I came from all this hard style karate stuff where things were mm, do it that way, right? Had no clue, right? So, you know, all well, this whole doubt now comes in with the vehicle, right? About the system. How can this possibly work if, well, now I know, right? But anyway, so um, let me just check my time here. Okay. So um, this is the same thing with this, right? So, once I understand that this is a good solution, this angle, this distance, this posture, this alignment, right? Is first I, I learn the mechanics and then I, I, I get some practice getting out of the way, right? But they're these straight line kind of things. But then 
One day I wake up and realize that the teacher has been saying this over and over again. And I was nodding, kind of like a bobblehead doll, right? But it wasn't registering. And what they kept saying was, it's not always all 45 degrees for you. You are to go to where you are profiled or flat to the attacker. So when this thing happens, you immediately go to a guard position and his next move is harder, but you are angled to the line of the attack. Well, that's easily dismissed when the attack is always coming on a straight line, right? But as soon as it starts changing, now I'm going to need to be more aware of where should I be so I'm still flat to him, right? but angled to the line of the attack so I don't have the problem with this attack knocking my arm out of the way or if I stiffen up to try to keep that from happening. Now it catches my shoulder, catches my spine, takes me off my feet, and he gives me an ass kick, right? So the training should evolve, right? Uh, but anyway, we just uh, – like, like – um, uh, Will had said earlier on, uh, Will said, uh, what you're talking about now is spot on, not just in self-protection, but in life. Uh, exactly, right? I, a bunch of us learned this a long time ago. I, I think we were lucky because we had teachers that were that were explaining the whole thing, and it wasn't so crystallized as, like the way this art is seen these days is like another martial arts choice among martial arts choices, but really in this art, the martial aspects are in place to keep you in the world, doing good in the world as you work with the other life lessons. Right. So it's, it's kind of bass backwards. Right. Um, so, but it, it works all the way around, but the trick here is, and that this is true, not just for self-defense, but for our whole life. Right. How do we keep from being a, being an accomplice to our own ass kicking? doesn't matter if it's life doing it, other people, whatever, right? It's, it's just very different, right? But like with anything personal development wise, right? Um, because we live in a safe culture, we have all kinds of time to work on things, right? Think about how long somebody has to work on uh, the issue of time management who has an issue with time management, okay? I think somebody who has an issue with time management should come into the dojo because if you procrastinate, you're going to get punched or kicked or grabbed or thrown or whatever, right? When you need to move, you need to move, right? So uh, a lot of, that's why I, I tend to put this under a personal development thing because there's a lot of things, respect, discipline, confidence, all kinds of things that people are constantly trying to fix. The passive way gets fixed very quickly with this because your well-being, not just your, your sensitivities, your well-being uh, is at stake every time you're training. So anyway, all right, um, I got a handful of folks on. I know it's midday and all that kind of stuff and um, it's just this time slot worked out for me today. But uh, uh, let me see if anything else came in, questions, comments. Uh, Will, I am, really booked up here the first half of this week, but I will try to send an email to you uh, or give you a call uh, when I can. Uh, I apologize between the house fire and, and uh, all these other things that are happening at the moment. Uh, time is really tight, but I will, but we do definitely need to catch up. Okay. It's always good to see old friends because when the, there's something happened in our, in our world uh, a bunch of years ago, right? Um, that just kind of changed everything for us because we had these bonds, right? Um, but a couple of times a year, right? We were always in the same location, catching up and chatting like we just seen each other last week, right? And then this thing happened and um, we're still in the world. We still think about each other. And I'm sure once we start chatting and all that, catch up very quickly and feel like we just chatted last week or whatever, but... Um, it's just, it's not the same. So anyway, and that's, that's for, for another episode, right? This, this weird family bond connection, spiritual kind of thing that happens in this realm that most people look at as crazy or odd because we punch each other and we do things to each other that 
sane human beings don't do, and we laugh about it. Okay. I think it's kind of crazy to sit around and watch the same freaking movie or TV show or episode for the 57th rerun because you don't either you either don't have any aspirations or won't get off your ass and work on the ones that you do. Um, so you'll go nowhere. I, to me, that's insane. But it's not my life. So anyway, uh, I really do have to kind of wrap this up. So uh, I don't see any other ones. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Let me just uh, fire something up here. Uh oh, I found some other controls and now I'm uh, trying to figure out where I need to be. Just give me half a second here to close this out. And if you have any questions or anything like that, if you're on Facebook, uh, you can look us up on Kudan Podcast. Uh, it's actually a uh, Facebook page, and I don't think it requires that you uh, sign up for it or anything like that, but you can go over there and like it and follow and all that wonderful stuff. Um, you can go to modernninjawarrior.com forward slash kuden dash podcast dash episodes. And uh, the first 68 that we did where I had my co-host uh, Shoshi White helping out with that, they're there. They are there. Right. Uh, and I just realized today I'm going to have to get a link fixed because there was a way to cut, get on the mailing list to uh, know about these things uh, uh, more in real time and other things that, that we're doing. Um, but anyway, there's there's ways to stay connected. Uh, also follow me over on YouTube. Some of you guys are already on YouTube, but you can follow me at uh, my page. Used to be Kage thirty six. I think it's still the same thing, but they made me pick a different URL. So, uh, if you look at the emails that have gone out or the posts on uh, the different platforms as they go out, the the the, the things are there, right? So, uh, why did that not load? <laughs> Hold on one second. I apologize. Something went wonky. All right, so. Uh, well, I'm going to let it go. I'm just going to wrap this up. There's a tail end of this thing. It should go on, but we'll do it through, it, through editing. So anyway, uh, I'll talk to everybody again, again, later this week, probably Wednesday. Tuesdays are killer for me. So probably on Wednesday, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, also remember, I'm, I'm just putting the final touches on uh, this new reboot of our um, the first module in our, uh, our our training program, which was really designed around handling uh, base level street defense with these concepts and principles from needed to, uh, to make those things happen. So it's both simultaneously a beginner's course to the full ninjutsu program, but it's also a street self-defense program using the basics because 95 to 98% of attacks that happen every day are easily handled by what we consider to be basics. So, uh, yeah, if you've been following along, you've kind of picked up on the different things that we're doing. And uh, I'll send that information out um, uh, as soon as it's ready. All right, that's it, guys. I'm going to wrap this up. I'll talk to everybody again next time. All right. Have a great day. Be safe. Train hard.